NASA grouper going, going, almost gone, on the brink of extinction. Over the last 40 years, the NASA grouper has been in decline in Belize. To stop this decline, we need to understand its history. It was once an abundant and economically productive fish in Belize, but because of heavy fishing pressure, populations have been in rapid decline and the fishery is now unsustainable. There were 13 viable sites in Belize in the 1800s. Fishing the grouper was a traditional part of Belizean culture. The Maya, the Creoles, the Spanish and the Garifuna fished these sites. In those days, there were estimates of up to 100,000 fish per site. Although the different cultures had their fishing grounds, they all shared one of the most abundant and accessible spots, Key Glory. Back then, the grouper were traditionally cut out of dories using hand lines and traps. Oh, you catch them by the thousands, yeah. Nine o'clock, ten o'clock. You got your amount. Initially, the fish were salted and much of the catch went to the surrounding countries for the Lent season. Sometimes the catches were so huge that some fishermen kept only the row and threw the fish away. In uh, Emily, uh, in the 1940s, they used to produce over 200 metric tons of grouper only on that spot at the, for, per year. In the mid-60s, the co-op started to freeze fish fillet for export and that's when the pressure really started. A lot more fishermen came out. It was cheaper for them to get ice than to buy wires to put them in pen. The enormous catches brought in during the 60s and 70s were of huge economic value to the country. It was not unusual for us to get over a hundred and odd thousand pounds of a whole grouper in a spawn period, which would be one month. With the increasing pressure for the export market, the NASA grouper were being heavily fished all over the country. In 67, 68, somewhere around there, with my dad down at um, Sapadillo, their bank, um, Rise and Fall, they would probably catch like three, four hundred groupers in like two hours. Of all the spawning sites, Emily was still under the heaviest fishing pressure. Many fish were being stockpiling pens and then transported fresh to the nearby co-ops. The first scientist to study them and raise the alarm about the decline was Jack Carter in the 1980s. Uh, and by the time that we did our survey, the populations had been reduced to just a few thousand uh, fish. And this was back in the, in the 80s. Jack Carter monitored catches at two major sites, Emily and Lighthouse. His data showed the drastic decline. At Emily alone in the early 80s, there were 15,000 fish. By the late 80s, there were only 5,000. The spawning grounds continued to be fished throughout the 90s with ever-decreasing catches. At Emily, the pens were now empty, but the fishermen continued to fish until 1999 when it all dried up. During that time, only one NASA grouper was caught for the whole season. A known grouper, not one grouper. Now we can't even catch one. <laughs> it's the difference. <laughs> nothing yeah. Two years now, nothing. Now conservation groups and scientists started to take a serious look at the declining grouper. At Gladden Spit, the situation was not much better than Emily. The Nature Conservancy under Will Heyman monitored the few remaining fish at Gladden. Saturday, none. Sunday, none. Monday, four. Tuesday, five. The spawning sites on the atolls of Lighthouse and Glovers were in better shape because of their remoteness. Both sites had approximately 5,000 fish in the early 90s, which dropped to about 2,700 by 1999. They were considered below sustainable levels. The situation at Glover's Reef, because of the presence of the Wildlife Conservation Society and the Fisheries Department, was better monitored than elsewhere. From 1999 to 2001, Intensive studies were done by Enric Sala from the Scripps Institute working with the Wildlife Conservation Society. They monitored the fish by counting, tagging and also collecting information on the fishermen's catches. Tags returned by the fishermen helped to keep track of the population. Radio tags allowed scientists to follow the grouper outside the spawning sites and track where they came from on the atoll. These data proved without doubt that the grouper at the spawning site were the same fish from around the atoll which returned year after year to breed. In order to understand the decline of the NASA grouper, 
it is important to have a thorough knowledge of its natural history and the reef that supports it. On the full moon of December through March, the grouper gather at their specific spawning sites. The experienced adult fish lead the newcomers to breed. This is why it is important to maintain a sufficient adult population. During the breeding, the spawning fish change between their barred normal coloring to three other color phases, the most characteristic of which is the bicolor or black and white phase. Schools of fish gather at the bottom and then small groups led by darker individuals rise up towards the surface. They release their spawn in bursts of passion. The clouds of fertilized eggs are dispersed by currents. They develop into larvae and hatch within 40 hours to float in the open ocean. Within seven weeks, the larvae develop into tiny fish which are carried behind the reef where they settle out into the algae beds. They then become juvenile NASA grouper that inhabit patch reef and seagrass beds. It is important to protect these nearshore nursery habitats which are being heavily impacted by dredging associated with coastal development. The groupers stay on the patch reefs for up to a year and are one of the top predators which keep the reef in balance. They are solitary and territorial and take shelter under coral. They are now easy prey for the spear fishermen. This is the other major reason for the NASA grouper's decline. The divers not only take the NASA grouper but many of its prey species. Not only the NASA grouper is being hammered but the parrot fish that are keeping the reef healthy for the same Nassau grouper that are living around there. It's another hard blow to, to just the Nassau grouper because the Nassau grouper needs to have their prey along that habitat reef. But then the, if you don't have the guys that keep the reef clean, um, the parrot fishes and the angel fish, then there's not even food for the grouper. So if you eliminate the grazers, like the parrot fish, the reef is not productive anymore. You are now causing an imbalance in that ecosystem. Despite this imbalance and the drastic decline of the NASA grouper from overfishing, little action was taken. It was not until conservationist Mita Paz, the son of a San Pedrano fisherman, took up the cause that anything was done. In 2001, we knew that the NASA grouper was declining. There was, has been several researchers within Belize that were studying NASA groupers, but they didn't have an overall picture of what was happening to the Grouper population for the whole country, right? So we decided to to do an assessment of all the spanning banks for NASA grouper, so we could have a complete picture of what the real status of NASA grouper population was in Belize. We surveyed nine spanning irrigation sites for the full moon of January and February simultaneously. The results of the survey showed at the two sites of Sanbor and Glovers, there were over 2,000 fish. These were considered at risk and not able to support fishing. At Gladden and Dag Flea, there were less than 500, making it threatened. Key Bokel and Key Glory were critically threatened and functionally extinct with less than 50. Rocky Point, Nicholas Key and Rise and Fall Key had no fish at all. They are extinct. Fishermen have to come to their grips, have to face reality that the fishes are not there like they used to be. They haven't gone somewhere else. 